to the first installment of the summer intro to paleo course. This is the first part of our process of paleontology series covering prospecting. Step one in prospecting is you have to know what you're looking for. Do you want to find plants, dinosaurs, mammals, trilobites, pollen, trackways, humans, or another type of fossil altogether? Um, you have to know what you're looking for in order to know where you need to look for it. Um, part of this is because different rocks have different types of fossils in them. So sandstones tend to preserve large bones and tracks as well. Limestones are often rich in shelly invertebrates. Shales are full of sea creatures, vertebrates, invertebrates, or plants. Um, shales can also have trackways in them um, or show evidence of burrowing creatures chewing up the uh, ooze on the bottom of the ocean. Chocks are made up of tiny plankton shells. Um, tufts are a volcanic ash that's really good for dating the rocks, even though it has no fossils in it. The salts are going to have no fossils at all because they're a lava flow. Anything that would have gotten caught in that would have been incinerated. There's nothing left. And then metamorphic rocks, in theory, could have fossils, as many metamorphics are derived from sedimentary rocks. But because of the high pressures and temperatures under which metamorphic rocks form, any fossils that were there are long since gone. So once you know where, what you're looking for, you have to know where to look. Um, geologists and paleontologists use two types of maps to figure this out. The first of these are geologic maps. So the more simple one is the one on the right-hand side, the geologic map of Illinois. Here you can see that most of Illinois is Paleozoic rocks. So Cambrian, Ordovician, there's no Solarian, or yeah, there is Solarian, uh, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, uh, Permian is the one that's missing, but mostly Paleozoic rocks, um, especially Pennsylvanian rocks. There's also a little bit of Cretaceous and a little bit of tertiary, but really you're not going to find dinosaurs or mammoths in Illinois. You're, what you are going to find are ammonites, trilobites, the little sea creatures that would have existed during the Paleozoic. Now, on the left-hand side, we have a geologic map of the entire United States. And this one gets a lot more complicated. Um, again, all the different colors refer to different time periods. But you can see, like in the western US, all the colors are jumbled together and really mixed up. And that's because that's where the mountain range are. So, um, more zoomed-in versions, you can see pretty much the whole history of time in some of these mountainous regions. Um, but on a big view like this, it just looks like a jumbly mess. Now, once you understand the geologic map, how to read that, and how that tells you where the different rocks come to the surface for the time period you're looking at, you need to look at a topographic map to figure out where you want to go look. Um, so this is a topographic map of an area in Colorado near Snowmass. And if you look up by, if you can see where it says Eagle Mountain, um, I don't have a pointer on this, unfortunately, um, that's the highest elevation. And the little red squiggly line um, is a creek, um, I believe Hunter's Creek. It doesn't have it labeled very well. Um, but that's the lowest point, so you know, all the little lines show a change in elevation. Um, so we use that to figure out, you know, are we looking for a deposit on the side of a cliff? Um, topographic maps tell geologists and paleontologists where it's actually feasible to look. Um, so step three is probably the most boring part of the process of prospecting. You have to get permission before you can go out and dig anywhere. Um, paleontologists really can't just pick a spot and start digging. Um, you need the permission of the landowners. Um, if you don't have the proper paperwork, custody battles take place over the fossils found. Um, Sue is a prime example of this, the big T-Rex housed at the Field Museum. The story of Sue is that it was found on an Indian reservation and the team of um, paleontologists who had gone out to dig up Sue had paid 
who they thought was the landowner, a rancher who had that section of land. Um, unfortunately, because it was on an Indian reservation, that was not sufficient permission today. So the federal government seized the fossil, returned it to the landowner, the rancher who they'd already paid, um, he auctioned it off for eight million dollars and now it's housed at the Field Museum um, instead of at the Black Hills Institute in South Dakota, which was where the team of explorers who were working on it um, were based and really is the museum that should have to. So it was a very, very messy process and there's still some hard feelings left over that despite it having been over 10 years now. So make sure you have permission before you do prospecting is the moral of the story. Well, once you've got that permission, you can head out to the site. Um, this is one of the vehicles um, we've used going out to um, a site in Colorado I've worked at. And you can see we plastered the side of the van with various leaf fossils that we hoped to find that day. Um, so prospecting varies depending on the type of fossil, obviously. Um, for showing invertebrates, fish scales, turtle shells, small mammals, you really just have to keep your eyes open. You find a likely rock formation of the right age and the right sediment, and crawl around on hands and knees looking for stuff on the ground. Um, there's really very little digging that goes into um, finding invertebrates or small mammals. For dinosaurs and larger mammals, you do a similar thing while prospecting. You still want to find the right formation um, in the right area, the right age. Um, you go out and look for the ends of bones that are weathered out. Um, then you can dig around that and see if it's just a little random chunk of bone, what we call chunkosaurus, or if it continues back into the hill. Um, if you can find lots of it, you found a quarry. You've probably got at least a partial skeleton of a dinosaur or a large mammal. Um, for leaves and insects, you find a likely hill and you take a pickaxe and you carve a trench into the hill. You then take your rock hammer, take stabs of stone and crack them open. Um, sometimes this results in absolutely gorgeous leaf and insect fossils, um, but if it's not, then you just go find another hill. Um, geologists who are really good at reading the rocks can often pick out these sites because they look for traces of old rivers. Um, Riverbanks have lots of trees and so are really, really good for finding uh, leaves and insects because they build up along the side of the riverbank or the edge of a lake. Um, so this is an example of a leaf site, and you can see they're taking pickaxes, carving into the hill, and then using a shovel to clean up the stuff that's falling around. Um, this is another site. Um, here we were actually not looking for fossils. We were looking for the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, and the little girl in the trench um, has her finger directly on the KT boundary there. And that's the uh, horizon for the extinction of the dinosaurs. So there's a lot of sites for further information. I'll put these links down in the deep video as well. Um, but they'll explain a lot more the process of prospecting. So that's it for today. Next time we'll come back with the process of paleontology. Um, looking at field work. Once you've found a site prospecting, what do you do with it? Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or put them in the comments. Thanks for watching.